Hello, everyone. I'm Jamie Flinchball, host of People Solve Problems, and we have a great guest uh, today, Steve Spear. Good to see you. Hey, Jamie. Good to connect. So a uh, little introduction. Um, you're the founder of Sea to Solve, senior lecturer at, at MIT Sloan, uh, author of the High Velocity Edge, which is a, a, a classic in, in, in the world of, of continuous improvement. And more recently, the co-author with Gene Kim of the uh, new book, Wiring the Winning Organization. So um, that's what we're going to talk about today. Outstanding. Thank you. So, uh, you know, we've known each other for, you know, probably close to 30 years with uh, uh, Kent Bowen um, being a, a common thread. Um, and so, you know, for those that are interested in your, your origin story, I'm going to refer people to uh uh, Mark Rabin's uh, Lean Blog podcast, uh, episode four ninety three, that you and oh, thank you, you and Gene talk about, you know, both of your stories as well as the origins of the book. So I won't retread uh, the ground you covered with Mark, um, but 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 tell us just a little bit about you know the the premise of the of the book and 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 what it's really all about. Yeah, no, uh, Jamie, this is fantastic, and thanks for the opportunity to share it. So. Without going into the origin story too much, the work I've been doing, it's, it's three decades now, back to our link with Kent Bowen, is um, around the existential threat so many enterprises have. I first became aware of this existential threat back in the 80s when um, you know, previously unknown Japanese uh, uh, companies um, were delivering value into society in volumes, in variety, cost, affordability, reliability, agility, et cetera, et cetera, that simply dwarfed what their 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 storied American counterparts were able to uh, generate. And then we saw the consequences, you and I, right? You know, U.S. Steel gone, Bethlehem Steel gone, RCA gone, General Motors, life support, right? And, um, you know, as part of that generation, as were you trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And what we realized, and this, you know, comes straight forward into the new book, is that, you um, the winning organizations, and not just the Japanese ones, it, it's true for the great American ones, the great European ones, great organizations in general. And it simply doesn't matter, sector, phase of value creation, the great organizations compete on their ability to harness the intellectual horsepower um, throughout their organization, creating conditions in which people can give full expression to their mind's potential to do creative, constructive things. It's full stop. That's it. And um, as far as uh, that goes, it, it's both by observation, process of elimination, the basic logic, right? Which is you start thinking about autos or any of these other hyper competitive industries, everything is the same, but the outcomes, right? So right. Um, you've got everyone looking in the same marketplace for opportunity and the opportunities that exist are pretty much available to everybody. I mean, we like to talk about disruptive innovation, but that's also everyone has the opportunity to look for the opportunity. Um, then you say, well, how do I meet and, you know, fill that opportunity? Well, I've got to uh, get raw materials available to everybody. Got to get capital equipment available to everybody. I have to operate within the legal, the regulatory, the rule framework. It applies to everybody. So if the environment around us is the same, you and me, and uh, the inputs are the same, you and me, and the only difference is the outcome, then there's something you're doing different inside than I'm doing. And what we can't appreciate is not the math, because everyone can use the math for algorithms, production control, this thing and that thing. The only thing left is um, the conditions you create for people to solve hard problems. And just one last thing, because I don't want to monotone on this, you know, monologue on this too much, is when you start thinking about this, this is something that really hit me. You know, when you and I were going through business school and whatnot, you know, there's the theory of the firmness and the theory of the firmness. And let me let me tell you Steve's theory of the firm, enterprise more generally. The reason we create enterprises in the first place is to solve really, really hard problems that are way beyond our ability as individual human beings. Um, no one person can figure out a medication. No one person can go to the moon and back safely, either in the 60s or now, right? No one person can do this. The reason we form organizations is the um, we need the critical mass of human intellect around solving problems. And once we recognize that, once we recognize that that is what we're doing, then it guides us towards our objective function, which is create the conditions in which that human intellect can be wildly well applied onto solving really hard problems, the solutions for which have great societal value. 
And, and the oversight, the oversight most organizations have is they think their objective function should be something about the efficiency with which, you know, literally or metaphorically, the efficiency with which materials should go through machines. And they forget entirely those machines are nothing but tools for people to express what they know. Anyway, right. I'll take a breath. No, it's 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 fantastic, and and I I love the you know sort of the the concept of working on really hard problems that we can't do by ourselves. Yeah. I I do a lot of mentoring of of young entrepreneurs through Lehigh University's uh, Ventures Lab, and nice. You know, I I always kind of say you know I, you, often you need a team, and if you don't think you need a team, is your problem even worth solving? Right that you, you know. that you think you can solve. So I yeah. I, I I love that thesis. So. The book goes into three core themes, uh, slowification, um, simplification, and amplification. So I want to I want to kind of ask about slowification because that's besides just being a new word, <laughs> it's it's actually a really hard uh, uh, hard thing to practice. And I, there's a, there's a reason I think it's probably first. So let me let me let me ask you this. You, you mentioned in the book. You mentioned the the other book, Thinking Fast and Slow, by Daniel Kahneman. Um, and I won't I won't go into all the details of that book for for the listeners, but I, I think a lot of people read that book and said, "Great, I want to live that way. I want to better understand that." But there's not a lot of operational advice. I kind of feel like your effort with slowification is how to build an oper operationalization of Kahneman's book. So yeah. I just want to test that concept with you and see what you think about that. Yeah. So first of all, I appreciate because Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in economics for the thinking that goes into that book. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> emphasizing the connection between his work and our work, man, I, I'm taking that flattery right away. Um, but yeah, 100 percent right. So as far as the uh, our book goes, um, you know, we, we start with the 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 observation. We all know that the differences in performance between the very best and everybody else is just extraordinary. Don't need to go into qualification, quantification of that. It's a huge. And then back to our premise, which is we can explain that paradox, you know, everything the same other than the outcomes by the ability to create um, this uh, protective space in which people can give fullest expression to their mind's uh, potential to do creative things on solving hard problems like we were just discussing. So then we were, um, you know, got into the questions like, well, if this is really about creating conditions in which individually and collectively, um, it's uh, easier or harder to solve problems. You know, what, what makes it hard to solve a problem? And uh, there's a bunch of things. One, you know, make it, make it a big, huge, hairy, highly intertwined, uh, intractable problem where you just can't even understand the structure of the situation. Um, and then, you know, give no control over the situation, raise the risk, raise the hazards. Um, don't give iteration, right? You know, you one shot, which of course, learning requires iteration. Um, you know, that's why when you play Wordle, for the people who play <laughs> Wordle, Whoever gets it on the first try, if you do, it's dumb luck. You need at least right. two, three, four tries to kind of converge on an answer. That's, you know, that you learn your way, you discover your way to the answer. So anyway, in our book, we look at all those qualities and we call that sucker the danger zone. Because you put your mind trying to solve problems in, in those conditions, you, you're in a losing situation. You're going you're gonna to lose most, if not all, the time. Then we say, well, what does the winning zone look like? You know, danger zone, winning zone. So the winning zone is everything like that, but the opposite. So the problems have somehow been simplified. And we talk about simplification as a way to make the problems themselves um, easier to solve and you know, modularization, incrementalism, all of that. But what we also say is what can we do to make the problem solving itself easier to do? And this, this is why we picked the word slowification is that Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, you know, he says, look, there, there, there's situations where we need fast thinking. You know, you see a light changing green to yellow to red. You don't want to have to go through the whole deliberation about what that means in terms of acceleration, deceleration, the anticipated reaction of all the other drivers on the road. You just want to know, oh, it's going green to yellow to red. I need to take my foot from the gas on the brake. No thinking. It just, it, it's eyes to feet. No, no, no processing. There's a lot of things we do in life where, um, thank goodness, we already have this fast thinking muscle memory built in because otherwise we'd be stuck all the time, mm -hmm. unsure about what to do and why to do it. So the other side, though, of uh, fast thinking is that it ill-equips us for new situations. 
because you get into a new situation. And if you're resorting to old habits, um, those old habits, that muscle memory may actually give you uh, not, uh, not only an inadequate answer, may actually drive you in the completely wrong direction. It's mm -hmm. like, it's like, for those who've uh, traveled and you end up, I don't know, you, you, let, let's say you fly to England and you land at Heathrow and you rent the car, if you resort to habits and pull out and then drive on the right, boom, that's yep. a mess, right? <laughs> so you, you land in London as an American, you know, you got to do some slow thinking and be deliberate and really, you know, who, what do I do now? When do I do it? You start thinking about it. You don't want to pull out of Heathrow Airport. I'm guessing I've never rented a car in London, but you don't want to pull out at rush hour when everything's flying around you. What you want to do in that situation, you want to, you want to pull out like early in the morning, the middle of the night. No one else is on the road. Well, probably early in the morning. No one else is on the road. You got a lot of visibility. The skies are clear. And you can think about, oh, wait, how do I get to the left? And how do I react? I see a car coming. Oh, I move to the left, not to the right. What do I do to make a turn? When do I signal? Do I get a left on red? Because at home, I get the right on red, right? So anyway, what was what, this idea of uh, slowification? It's changed. You, you know the movie The Matrix, where uh, Neo, when he's finally getting, I don't know right. what they call it in The Matrix, like in, in the Star in Star Wars, is you know he's feeling the force. Yeah. But anyway, whatever the equivalent is in The Matrix. It and clicks. there's Neo, and the bad guys are going, bing, bing, bing. You know, most everybody else, the bullets fly, they get hit, they fall down, but not Neo, right? And why is that? Because for him, the world has slowed down. He can say, oh, there's a bullet coming at me. What do I do? Oh, I do one of these. Here's another bullet. Oh, I do one of these. The, the, things slow down, and he can go from fast thinking to slow thinking behavior. And um, he can be creative. He can be generative. He can be self-reflective. He can be self-critical. He can do all those things we need to get, get new ideas. So anyway, slowification. What we're trying to do is convey this idea of, in Hollywood, what they call bullet time this slowing things down. Now, just one last thing is why we call it slowification because you're writing a book for managers. Turns out the term bullet time is fine in Hollywood, but it, try <laughs> to write a sentence around it in a management book. Good luck with that. The other part is um, we wanted to do respect for uh, Dr. Kahneman because, you know, yeah. this whole no, you know, and, and if he writes a book called thinking fast and slow, we want to use the word slow. The other thing was why we had to invent the word is that there's actually no English word to capture exactly that notion of slowing the conditions down so that the human mind can go from fast to slow thinking. We found the German word. It's like 30 letters. They're all consonants, you know? Right. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, we, we invented a word. Sure. German words are rarely the solution <laughs> down <laughs> that, down that path. So, right. so uh, yeah, I'll, just to share my personal experience and then I'll, I'll I'll, I'll use this to to get to my my next key question. You know, I I found that you know a lot of the thinking that I need to do because I I really try to prioritize working with clients on hard problems. I just don't want easy stuff at this point in my life. Yeah. So I want fun, interesting, hard problems. So it's hard to go into these problems with an hour in between other meetings. So I've started blocking off whole days where I have no interruptions, um, yeah. my, my phone's plugged in over in another area and I can just focus. And that works so much better to engage in these messy things, whether they're my own or somebody else's. Now, you know, to do, to set myself up for that, I have a, I have two to-do lists. One is for days when I have meetings and the other is, I literally call it deep think to-dos. And yeah, yeah. It, it's for those days. So I try to separate the tasks. So how do you know what goes in what bucket? How, you know, we have a hundred problems flying at us, a hundred bullets flying at us. How do you tell the difference of what bullets should get fast thinking and what bullets should get slow thinking? Yeah, so Jamie, I think the, you had the answer. And the key part is, is partitioning and committing the time to do the slow thinking. See, here, here's what too often happens is people feel under some sort of uh, operational pressure. Oh, I've got to get the job done. I've got to get the job done. I've got to get the job done. Or I've got to get the job done and I'm falling behind. So I don't have time and I can't commit time away from performance into planning and planning with aggressive feedback and red teaming and stress testing. I don't have time to go from performance back into practice, but practice not to... Um, 
ingrain the already scripted routine, but to actually find flaws in the routine. Um, I don't have time. Now, now, now here's, here's the problem with that. If you're feeling so much pressure in the, in, in the performance phase of your work and the execution phase of your work, and you're even falling behind, you know why that is? Because you don't know how to do it. So you don't feel pressure, yeah. right? That, that, that whatever you're doing is adequate to the point of being in distress. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you start thinking out loud is what, so the logic is I know well enough when I do this, that I'm in a distressed situation. So let's say doing more of it, I'll go further into distress. Or if I do it faster, I'll go into distress faster. And if I do more of it faster, I'll go into more distress even quicker than that. Anyway, that's the logic part. But there's also the empirical part on this, Jamie, which is um, exactly what you said, which is I have a calendar and I commit time, whether it's part of a day or part of a week, whatever it is, where I'm stepping out of that execution performance environment back into the environment where things are slowed down, the bullet time, where I can plan something up and sketch it out and then have someone say, oh, let me tell you what sucks about it. I can plan something out and model it, you know, literally or figuratively and have someone poke holes in it, literally or figuratively. I can map something out or script it or choreograph it and try to execute against that routine and find out what's wrong with the routine. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the that's the critical step is getting ourselves out of the performance environment with all its operational pressures back into planning where we can stress test and red team back into practice where we can run lots of iterations to find out what's wrong with the plan and what's wrong with the people who have to uh, adhere to it and, and correct flaws in our thinking before they become consequential flaws in our doing. So that, that's critical. What you what just uh, there's one digression or I, I would offer is um, as to which problems come back into that committed time for problem solving. There's actually three parts to my answer. One is like a huge oorah validation of committing time, just like you said. One is that um, we actually, we can't prioritize. And here's why. Because the problem we can solve is the one that's right in front of our face. The problem is way down range. We don't know enough about the situation to even characterize it, let alone assess it and diagno diagnose it to even solve it. So we got that one right in front of us. There's another part of it is that the one right in front of us, we actually don't know the consequences it'll have. You know, and, and you know, before we started recording, you were talking about, you know, the raised sidewalk or the cord running across a, a corridor. It, is someone gonna trip over that? We don't know. Maybe they will and they'll stumble. Maybe they will and they'll recatch their balance. Maybe they'll stumble and fall. Maybe they'll stumble, fall and bang their head. We don't know. All we know, there's a cord across the walkway. So yep. it, we got to solve for that because we, we don't know if and when and how it'll have consequence. So that, that gets to a, a second part or a third part, right? One is absolute, we got to commit to time. Second thing is we got to solve the problems that are right in front of us and not say, oh, we're going to, and there's another part about this and I'll, I won't delay it too much. Why do we have problems? It's we have situations we don't well understand. So if you get into this whole thing, it's like, oh no, Jamie, step back. What we have to do is do a, an inventory of all the problems we have and then prioritize and this and that. It's like, wait, hold on a second. The reason you have all these problems that you know about and forget about the ones you don't even know about is because you're too ignorant to not have the problem, right? It, it's yeah. your ignorance is actually causing these things. And so now what you're trying to do is take the same ignorance, which allows the creation, the existence of these problems, and use that same ignorance to solve them and prioritize them. Forget about it. You can't do that. So you got to pick them up so as you see them, see it, solve it, move on to the next one. See it, solve it, move on to the next one. But anyway, so what does that mean? If you got a lot of problems in your organization, then um, you can't be the only one solving them. You got you got you got to build that bench strength. Right. Ideally, it's everybody all the time has that capability to see problems, and everybody has committed time to solve them. And, and, and Jamie, that's the winning organizations. That's what they do, right? Which is say, look, you know, we have an enterprise where the enterprise is 5, 50, 5, 15, 500 people, whatever it is. We want to make sure each and every day we're engaging all those minds. And, and the folks who say, well, we have 5, 15, 500, whatever. And every day we're going to engage only 3%, 5% of the minds and let everyone else just be the brawn to the brain. What a huge disadvantage. So anyway, commit the time, the next problem in front of you, 
because there's so many of them coming at you all at once. You got to make sure you got a lot of problem solvers with committed time. Awesome. That, that summarizes it all so well. And, uh, I have one last quick question for you before we 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 close. Um, but if people want to learn more about solidification and these other concepts, they can check out the Wiring the oh, Winning absolutely. Organization book. So probably the biggest pushback. And I'm just gonna look for your your bumper sticker answer, your one sentence answer. Yeah, all right. When when somebody says, Yeah, but I don't have time, too busy. What's your what's you know, if I'm too busy for solidification, um, what's your what's your one second? or one sentence response to that. All right. So uh, the one sentence answer is, um, you've told me the cost of getting smarter. What you haven't told me is the cost of staying stupid. Love it. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's uh, we, we underestimate the risk of, of staying where we are in, in all that's of them. Right. So I, I, that's a great response. I love it. So, uh, Thank you for uh, coming on and talking about your book. Thank you for writing the book. And uh, absolutely, thanks for all your contributions. And uh, hope our listeners uh, learn something, pick up the book, and learn even more. Yeah, Jamie, I appreciate that. And just one last thing is back to the, uh, the the cord laying across the corridor, right? Which is uh, someone can make a case every day about uh, what's the cost of uh, fixing the situation so you don't have that trip hazard. You know, oh, yeah. but what, what they'll never explain to you is what's the cost of leaving the cord there, the trip hazard? And yep. it turns out that the, the potential cost is just off the charts. Potential, and we don't know. So we might right. as well solve it before we find out. Bingo, yeah. Fantastic, thanks so much. Jamie, thank you. And you know, I just want to say uh, thanks because you give a platform and voice and expression to such critically important ideas. And, and I don't care how you measure the importance of it. It could be in a very sort of a uh, commercial uh, uh, fashion of, if you do these things, um, you'll be richer. Uh, that's great. <laughs> you, you, you could say, if you do these things, society will benefit. If you do these things, the people in your organization will be able to say at the end of the day, you know, I did something important rather than squandering the, uh, the, the very scarce, perishable time I have. Whatever it is, however people are motivated, you're given a uh, voice and platform and expression to some critically important ideas. And that's a, that's a huge valuable service to society. So thank you for that. Oh, that's the goal. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the People Solve Problems podcast. Let's keep the conversation going. Visit jflinch.com for more episodes and other content. And continue to join us on your podcast app, of course. We greatly appreciate your feedback through reviews and ratings. Consider expanding your understanding of problem solving with Jamie's book, People Solve Problems, The Power of Every Person, Every Day, Every Problem. Available on Amazon. Until next time, keep learning, innovating, and solving problems.